Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the first session in Venable's Virtual Ad Law Symposium webinar series. This series will cover current trends, topics, and developments in the advertising industry, including NAD regulation, privacy developments, and enforcement trends, and FTC enforcement priorities in the new administration. Today's session is National Advertising Division at 50 Years, Regulation and Self-Regulation Over the Past 50 Years. My name is Shaheen Rothermel. I'm an attorney in Venable's Advertising and Marketing Group, and I'm joined today by Laura Brett and Mary Engel. Laura Brett is the Vice President of BBD National Programs and the New York Office Leader, and she leads BBD's National Programs National Advertising Division, or NAD. She began leading NAD in August of 2017 after serving several years as an NAD staff attorney and assistant director. During her tenure at NAD, she has helped develop NAD's body of cases and guidance, in addition to speaking regularly on issues surrounding truthful and transparent advertising in all media. Ms. Brett has published multiple articles and been quoted in the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. I'm also joined today by Mary Engel. Mary is the Executive Vice President of Policy for the BBP National Programs, where she oversees and develops advertising, privacy, and other self-regulatory and dispute resolution programs. She joined the BBP National Programs in 2020, following a 30-year career at the Federal Trade Commission. At the FTC, she held several management positions, including Associate Director for the Advertising Practices. While at the FTC, she played a lead role in developing the FTC's policies on advertising substantiation, influencer mar marketing, native advertising, online disclosures, health-related advertising, child-directed mar marketing, alcohol advertising, video game marketing, and green marketing. Today's session is eligible for CLE credit. The code for obtaining CLE credit will be given during the presentation. Please also submit any questions you have for the panelists by using the question and answer function within the webinar platform. While we may not be able to answer all of your questions live during the presentation, we will follow up with answers once the webinar has concluded. So please feel free um, to ask any and all questions that you might have. So no advertising presentation would be complete if we didn't show you some example of advertisements. So we're going to take a walk down memory lane here and, um, and see some advertisements. Ring around the collar, ring around the collar. Now try whisk. Concentrated whisk goes right on the dirt. Its unique formula sinks in and starts to clean before you start to wash. Introducing new Aerox with 50% more plastic. You know how I save money with unsweetened Kool-Aid and sugar, just like my mom did. Today, with my sugar, it's about 12 cents a quart. Has vitamin C, too. I like giving Kathy what my mom gave me. Safeguard's family album presents the traveling family who went 6,000 miles on one bar of soap. <laughs> no, one kind of soap. Safeguard. Come on, the whole family, the teenager, the baby used a deodorant soap? Oh, it's more than that. Safeguard helps prevent infection of diaper rash, infection of acne. Okay, now scrub with an abrasive cleanser. Come on, really scrub. Okay, stop. Stop. Okay, pick them up at the corners. What did you see happen again? Same thing that happened the first time. The body fell apart and the Viva didn't. He likes it. He likes it. When you bring life home, don't tell the kids it's one of those nutritional cereals you've been trying to get them to eat. You're the only one who has to know. The Philip Morris Company has bought all commercial time on the first half hour of all the network talk shows tonight. That is the last half hour on which it is legal to sell cigarettes on radio or television in the United States. I like to teach the world to sing, sing with me. Today we're going to talk about uh, what the National Advertising Division is. We'll discuss some differences about the way the NAD operated when it was initially formed versus today. Um, there have also been a number of recent developments and exciting new initiatives developed by NAD, and we'll talk about those as well. And finally, we'll address what we can expect to see from NAD for the next 50 years. So let's start with a background into NAD and where it sits uh, within the BBP National Program's uh, umbrella. I'll let Mary speak to that. Thanks, Shaheen, and good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, so those ads were from 50 years ago. 
And I confess that I remember many of them, <laughs> definitely old enough to do that. Um, when the NAD and our appellate division, the National Advertising Review Board were formed back in 1971, um, at that time, the ad industry got together. It was the ad trade associations, the ANA, the AAF, the 4 ace and the Council of Better Business Bureaus got together and formed the National Advertising Division and the National Advertising Review Board. Um, now, um, uh, you might see on this, on this slide, it doesn't say anything about the Council of Better Business Bureaus. And that's because two years ago, the council reorganized into two separate organizations. Um, one of them is the International Association of Better Business Bureaus, or IABBB, and that's where all the local BBBs are housed. And then the other organization is BBB National Programs, where Laura and I work, and that's where the National Advertising Division and the NARB, the Children's Advertising Review Unit, the Children's Food and Beverage Advertising Initiative, and a number of others are housed. Um, and in fact, today we have over a dozen different self-regulatory and dispute resolution programs in the areas of advertising and privacy. And we just added a few more uh, recently this year uh, in privacy, global privacy uh, under the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation or APEC for uh, cross-border data transfers. So, so that's why you see this, we call it the Starburst. This slide is um, um, our logo with the, net, with the different programs that we have going on today. But NAD and NARB, they're the oldest. 50 years uh, this year, we're very happy to be, to be celebrating our 50th anniversary. I think, turn it over to you now, Laura. Uh, thanks, Mary. So yes, we're very excited that NAD and NARB are celebrating our, our 50th anniversary. Um, you might think that it was the idealism that you witnessed in that uh, Coke commercial of you know teaching the world to sing that that led to the formation of this industry system of independent self regulation. However, I think there was a lot more realism behind the founding of NAD. Um, there was a real view that um, that advertising was misleading consumers and and harming uh, fair competition and and really leading to a lot of consumer distrust. Um, and there was a real real fear that there was going to be increasing regulation or increasing regulatory enforcement of existing regulation. Um, and, and, you know, you, in the little vignette at the beginning, you saw that in fact, in 1971, the same year that NAD was founded, um, there was regulation that restricted advertising for tobacco products on television and on radio. Uh, so I think the advertising industry got together and very realistically decided that an industry self-regulatory forum could in fact give them a little more predictability about how to um, advance the ball and creating trust in the marketplace and, and hopefully prevent additional regulatory enforcement or additional regulation. And that's, that's what led to NAB's founding. It, and, and it's been a very effective mechanism for the 50 years that allows industry to raise the bar on advertising and advertising practices. And, and that's really what we do every day. Um, we look at advertising claims and we look at the support for them and determine whether or not there's a good fit between the two. And we do that in two different contexts. We look at competitor challenges where a competitor in the industry decides that if they're following the rules, they want their competitors to follow the rules too. Um, but we also open cases on our own initiative um, where we, uh, we review the marketplace, we take com uh, consumer complaints, we get complaints from the BBBs, we still have a relationship with the BBBs to take complaints from them. We also look out in the marketplace on the kinds of advertising practices that are undermining consumer trust in advertising and open cases on those issues as well. Um, the process is set to be more efficient than litigation. Um, it, it involves two submissions from each side when it is a competitor challenge. Each side meets separately with, with the National Advertising Division um, and the attorney assigned to the case and either me or one of the deputy directors uh, all attend that, will, will attend that meeting. Um, and then after the meetings, we deliberate, discuss, and ultimately draft a decision that gets sent to the parties. Um, the process is fairly efficient, uh, especially when compared to litigation. And that's largely because there's no discovery, there are no depositions, and there are no counterclaims. So um, the, the, the dispute is limited to the specific claims that are challenged at the outset. But uh, you know, also there is no, there are no monetary damages. Uh, all we look at is the advertising claims and make recommendations about those advertising claims. But there, you cannot get monetary damages. So there are limitations.
questions. We try and make the process predictable by having um, procedures that we follow regularly in all cases. Um, and we also make sure that the process is predictable and, and, and you know, that companies can understand where we're likely to come out on it by publishing all of our case decisions. And, and that's right. NAD, I think, provides a lot of our clients with, with certainty. So we've got a published body of case precedent with guidance on specific claims. And I think it's one of the largest, if not the largest body of cases out there on advertising claims. It's the NAD is staffed by decision makers who have specific experience in resolving advertising disputes, looking at advertising claims. And the NAD also provides a process for Review, uh, appealing adverse decisions to the National Advertising Review Board, or NARB. And we often get questions as practitioners, should we go to the NAD, should we go to court? And, and I think that the NAD really offers uh, companies who are looking to, to see some redress from, from com their competitors' claims, it offers a lot of, a lot of benefit. It, unless you um, are going to go to court and, and go for a preliminary injunction or temporary restraining order, which are ha hard to get, uh, NAD is probably the fastest thing, and NAD also has a new process that's even faster. So I think that's one of the benefits. Uh, you have certainty. A lot of times if you go in front of a judge, you might be one of only a couple of advertising cases this judge has ever seen, and you don't know oftentimes how that judge is going to come out. Whereas NAD, you've got a body of precedent. You know how it's going to come out. I think NAD also is good for companies of different sizes, regardless of the size of the company. There, it's very accessible, and NAD also has experience in multiple different verticals and, and industries. And, and I don't know, Laura, if you'd like to give a, a couple of examples of those industries so that uh, we have a wide variety of clients, and I mean you have just as wide a variety of experience in, in adjudicating those disputes. Sure. I mean, we've looked at everything from motor oil to baby diapers to infant formula to uh, dietary supplements, uh, OTC drugs. Um, you know, we really can look at any kind of advertising. We've seen a recent, you know, a couple of cases in the automotive industry. Um, we even looked at jewelry claims recently. So really there's no limitation. We'll look at B2B claims too. Um, we've looked at healthcare provider directed advertising. So, um, so generally, you know, any industry can really use NAD and, and we hope new industries that haven't tr traditionally used NAD will consider it as an option when they are trying to make sure that there's a level playing field and, and raise the bar um, so that everybody's playing by that same set of rules. Great. And, I, and we, we had one question about whether or not NAD's uh, recommendations are binding or um, do, do companies sign an agreement to be bound? Laura, I don't know if you want to answer that. Sure. Happy to talk about that. And I know we're going to get into a little more detail on this in a minute. Um, NAD is a voluntary process. It's a self-regulatory process. Um, however, our, um, our recommendations are followed over 90% of the time, um, you know, 90, 95% of the time. We have a really high rate of voluntary compliance with our recommendations. And that's in large part because of the support that the Federal Trade Commission provides uh, to self-regulation. Uh, they, they have a transparent mechanism that we'll talk more about that demonstrates that they really take seriously any referrals to them. Um, so if a company doesn't participate or comply with our recommendations, exactly they refer to the, the Federal slide. Trade Commission. So we, could, we can move yeah. over to the next slide because that's exactly what we're about yeah. to talk about. Yeah, great. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, the, the FTC has long uh, supported self-regulation generally and specifically in advertising and with the NAD. And back when NAD was founded, the FTC was a cheerleader for the process. And in the early days, the chairman at the time, Lou Engman, specifically spoke uh, and supported you know, the success of industry self-regulation and thought, you know, while the government would be looking out for consumer trust, it was also important for industries to look out for that as well and keep it a level playing field. And so over the decades, the FTC, the commissioners, bureau directors have supported uh, self-regulation in given vocal support in their speeches, but in addition, there is logistical support. So um, if an advertiser does not comply with an NAD decision or doesn't participate in the process, the matter gets referred to the Federal Trade Commission or another government agency. And the FTC will look at that and decide whether it's a matter they wanna open or not. Um, 
Uh, I was at the FTC, uh, as Shaheen mentioned, for a long time and, um, and, and was in the advertising practices division where we got most of the referrals from the NAD. And, um, you know, we would look at those referrals and at a minimum encourage the company uh, to back, go back and participate if the reason for the referral was non-participation or non-compliance. Um, sometimes uh, it happened that the referral was related to an issue that the FTC was looking at at the, at, at the time, um, was within the current strategic priorities, and so the commission would decide just to open the investigation and not encourage them to go back, and a good example of that is a Corga case, and in that case, Corga was selling a dietary supplement called Grave Defense that claimed to be able to turn your gray hair back to its original color. FTC was also looking at a couple of other supplements making the exact same claim. And when the Corga case came the FTC's way on referral from the NAD, the FTC investigated and Corga didn't you know, agree to settle or play ball. So the FTC filed lawsuit in federal court, ended up filing for summary judgment and getting uh, a good decision from the judge um, there. And, uh, and, the, and the company was ordered to, to pay uh, in redress its, its uh, net sales. So that's a, a good example of where <laughs> I would have gone a lot easier on the company had they participated with NAD. And, and actually that's not that unusual. There are a number of other instances, a few of them are up on the slide where um, NAD initially looked at the advertising claims and then the FTC later brought a lawsuit. And um, sometimes the FTC will have already been investigating it um, sometimes not, uh, but uh, almost always the FTC case comes out later, if only because as, as uh, Laura and Shaheen were just mentioning, the NAD will move much more quickly than an FTC investigation will. I guess, I think we can go to the next slide. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, if, um, uh, if the company doesn't participate or comply with the NAD decision, the matter will get referred to the appropriate federal agency uh, and sometimes the state attorney general too, actually. Uh, usually that's the Federal Trade Commission but uh, because the FTC's jurisdiction is so broad, but occasionally it might be another federal agency, the FDA or the FCC. Um, uh, mostly it's the FTC. And so, and the, so the FTC um, you know, has a process in place uh, as I just mentioned, for looking at referrals and, and a long history of supporting self-regulation and wanting to be the backstop, the regulatory backstop for self-regulation. And, and that, of course, is going gonna, is gonna to be another way of encouraging participation in the self-regulatory process. Um, and, and the FTC um, you know, will look at every referral that comes its way. Um, it, it gets, you know, tens of thousands of complaints probably annually on all sorts of matters. And, and um, those are handled by the Consumer Response Center by, by and large, but referrals from the NAD are, go directly to the relevant division, usually the Ad Practices Division, um, and are reviewed by an attorney there. So it, it gets a much higher level of, of attention than just your average complaint to the FTC. So back to Shannon. <laughs> Oh yeah, I, I was going to say, and Mary, they also I published the resolution of referrals, and that was that was something that you you started, right? Yeah, there's a, actually another slide that we go into that a little bit more down down the road. Great. So um, why don't we why don't we take a, a look at at the NAD over time and talk a bit about that? Laura, would you like to talk about the case decisions and how sure. they've changed yep. over the past 50 years? Yeah, absolutely. So um, so when NAD first started publishing its decisions, um, they were pretty bare bones. You know, it talked about the, the case, the parties, um, the, the very summary description of the basis of inquiry and, and what the resolution was, what, you know, whether or not the advertising claims have been recommended to be discontinued. Um, over the years, though, we've made our decisions much more robust. Um, you know, you can see that our home wonderful decision was 47 pages long. Um, a recent tied pure clean decision was, you know, a, more than 11 pages long. Uh, but, but, but certainly, the the cases are long enough that you see not just what the parties argued, but but what NAD's reasoning was in um, in reaching its conclusion. And the purpose of that really is so that the case decision stands 
for not just um, the, the, the issue that we looked at in that particular case, but also provides guidance to companies as they're looking at similar issues. Um, I, I will say that you know, the 47 page decision is probably a thing of the past because uh, one thing we've done more recently is actually shorten the decisions to uh, eliminate a detailed summary of the party positions and rather to just lim it limit the, the decision itself to our reasoning and in our analysis of the issues. Um, and part of the reason for that is really so that we didn't disclose too much information about the underlying case um, and only the, the information that was necessary to explain our reasoning. Um, we also look at advertising in all media. Um, so, uh, you know, back when NAD was founded, we looked at television advertising and print advertising and um, advertising uh, in in retail locations. We've always looked at label claims as part of our um, as a part of our purview, um, but but also you know the kinds of um, shelf talkers and things that you'll see in, in grocery stores have always been part of our um, advertising review. But more recently, all the advertising campaigns we review are multimedia ad campaigns. So we look at social media uh, advertising, we look at influencer marketing. We also look at your website. Your website is definitely part considered part of your advertising uh, as are all of your social media pages. So um, so that's, you know, that's an area where I think the, the the flexibility of self-regulation has really been demonstrated because we've been able to adapt and, and review advertising claims wherever it appears. A good example of that is the case that we looked at recently um, related to advertising for bounty paper towels. This is in fact a, a case that we brought on our own initiative. And um, the case, you know, it was a, it was a TikTok campaign. Um, it was a dance challenge. Uh, they're fun to watch. And this one was was uh, being promoted uh, using the hashtag bounty partner um, and and PNG had partnered with some influencers to go out there and, and create some dances and put them up on TikTok. Um, so that's all fine. They all had their proper disclosures when they're when the influencer marketing post was up on TikTok. The problem was that if anybody went to share those TikTok videos, the the um, the disclosure about it being influencer market marketing did not transfer. So during the course of the challenge, P&G took steps to ensure that the influencers who were promoting bounty paper towels uh, embedded their material connection disclosure into the video itself uh, because the TikTok platform doesn't allow for transferring those disclosures. It's still a problem on TikTok. And if, you're out, if you are using influencer marketing on TikTok, I would just ask that you take a, a close look at trying to have your own workaround. Um, so that the, if people are going to share those videos, that they that they have the appropriate disclosures when shared. And I think that that's a great example of how uh, NAD can be really nimble as new types of social media and, and just platforms appear and, and advertisers are using different types of platforms. And now you can transfer ads across platforms. So as that technology is improving, NAD is really uh, looking at those and, and providing guidance for what you're doing on those. And, and here are a couple of other examples. The Miller Coors uh, case involved a uh, know your beer taste test where people were given unidentified beers to taste. And then they asked, they were asked which one uh, had more taste. And they also had the same type of videos on uh, social media. They had influencers doing the same thing. And um, the campaign wasn't a, a scientific taste preference uh, a test. And the, the problem uh, that was identified was that the influencer videos did display a taste preference. Uh, it, it conveyed a message of taste preference that there wasn't a substantiation for. And, and again, that's an example of you have to make sure you know what your influencers are doing and, um, and, uh, and, and you can be responsible for the claims that they're making. Another example uh, is, is native advertising. We see a lot of these. And this was a case involving a mattress manufacturer uh, Amerisleep sold m mattresses, and it had two websites, sleepjunkie.org and savvysleeper.org, that they looked to be review websites, and they discussed various types of mattresses, but they were uh, operated by Amerisleep. And there was a disclosure uh, on the website, but the problem was that it wasn't uh, conspicuous. It, it appeared sort of, as you can see, between between larger font, it, it appeared in smaller font. And so so that, that disclosure wasn't, wasn't conspicuous enough, and it also wasn't exactly clear to explain that the website was, uh, was operated by Amerisleep. And a couple of other factors that NAD looked at to determine 
whether it was clear to consumers that this was actually advertising for Amerisleep were um, the URL, for example, you can see that it's .org. There wasn't really a Marisleep branding on the website, so it wasn't it wasn't clear to consumers that this was um, this was not an independent site that it was in fact uh, native advertising for Amerisleep. Mary, we talk, talked about this a little bit earlier, but do you want to talk about the resolution of referrals from BBB national programs? Yeah. Yeah, so here's the um, larger slide. Um, so back, um, as I said, the FTC has always supported self-regulation, but um, it, it hasn't always been as transparent, perhaps, the process of referrals as it is now. And, and I know that when um, I initially uh, became the head of ad practices and started getting the referrals from NAD, um, you know, we would hear complaints over the years that, well, what happens? It's kind of a black hole. Like the, you know, the, these referrals come to the FTC, but no one knows what happens to them, uh, where they go. And internally, we had uh, a very good uh, structured process for handling referrals in terms of acknowledging receipt back to NAD, assigning them to an attorney to review, and so forth. But in terms of the resolution, what happened? It wasn't so great. So. Uh, some years ago, uh, before Laura was the head of NAB, was the former uh, director, Andrea Lewine, um, and I to put our heads together to try to figure out, okay, what can we do here to make it less of a, of a black box? And so we decided that it would be really great to have the letters that's showing, first of all, to have a public resolution letter uh, for every matter that gets referred. Um, I think it was kind of haphazard before and then to make those available publicly in a place where everybody could find them. So we did create um, a page on ftc.gov where all of the resolution letters for uh, NAD referrals are posted. And actually, it's you can see on this page, it's not just NAD, it's other BBB national programs who, uh, who do refer matters to the FTC from time to time, including KRU. DSSRC, that's the Direct Selling Self-Regulatory Council, and the former ERSP. Um, so you can find that page uh, probably most easily if you go to ftc.gov and, and search for NAD, um, it comes up. At least it did when I tried it. Um, but um, in that way, all of the letters uh, are posted there so you can see. Now, they take time because it may you know, sometimes it's very quick, sometimes it could be a very long time that the agency is working with the company to try to get them to change their claims, for example, or perhaps they decided to investigate. And so the end result of the referral is going to be a case, as in that Corga case I mentioned earlier. So it's not like you can just see, you know, a referral, and then a few months later, you'll see a resolution letter. It's not quite like that. Um, but now uh, there's a, this very uh, public and transparent uh, process for publicizing the referrals of, from NAD and the other BDD national programs. And, and Mary, maybe you could also speak a little more broadly too about uh, how has the FTC's relationship with NAD uh, specifically or BDD national programs generally changed over time during your ten tenure there? Yeah, well, I think it's always, there's always been, uh, it's always been a strong relationship. Um, the FTC has has supported self-regulation as being basically, and NAD is basically being another cop on the beat, right? Um, there's uh, plenty of deceptive advertising to go around. So, and the FTC, of course, has limited resources. So for the, the ability of the NAD to take a look at advertising, um, if it's finding it misleading, getting it stopped, you know, that can be one less thing that the FTC has to look at. There are always going to be cases the FTC is going to want to pursue regardless. Let's say if it's important to um, get money back to consumers or for some other reason, but the FTC um, support, supports advertising self-regulation. And then the NAD, you know, as I mentioned vocally in speeches, uh, FTC will speak at the NAD annual conference every year. And um, just by putting a priority on any referrals that do come the FTC's way shows that, you know, th that the FTC really believes in the importance of the NAD and self-regulation uh, more broadly um, to help encourage a level playing field for
for our businesses and of course, less deception of consumers as a result. And Laura, I don't know if, you, if you'd like to speak about it from the other side, what it would what it's been like from your perspective. Sure. I mean, you know, the FTC is very responsive. Um, and uh, I saw a question pop up. People asked whether or not these are public, these resolution letters. They are, in fact, public. Um, if you search for NAD and FTC, you're, it's usually going to bring you to this page. And um, it, it will show you the transparent resolution of referrals of NAD cases. Um, it's also important to share with your audience that we have a new mechanism for um, uh, for or a new support for self-regulation that's coming from platforms. Um, specifically, Facebook has demonstrated that it supports truth in its platform by um, by partnering with the National Advertising Division and giving us a sort of a direct reporting mechanism. If a company doesn't participate in self-regulation or doesn't follow our recommendations, we can send that advertising straight over to Facebook. Um, and Facebook can, uh, and Facebook will take a hard look at it and see whether or not that advertising complies with um, Facebook's um, policies, which do require that advertising on its platform be truthful. And, and we found them to be also very responsive. That's a great point that we have, we have these regulators, but we also have regulation within platforms that, that have almost the same, really the same effect of, of, of getting NAD decisions enforced. So I think that's really a great point. And we're going to be working with other, we have, uh, we're trying to get other platforms to have the same policy. One has um, informally agreed and not publicly agreed, but, but we expect that other platforms will hopefully follow suit and demonstrate that they are committed to truth on their platforms. That's, that's great. And Laura, would you like to speak a bit about uh, advertising substantiation? Sure, sure. So again, when we were looking at those 1971 ads at the outset, you saw some, you know, <laughs> saw some comparative performance claims. You saw some um, claims about Mikey liking it. Um, you saw all kinds of, uh, you know, claims that require support. And uh, very often, those are the kinds of claims that come before NAD more often than you're going to see them anywhere else. Uh, you know, courts do have some false advertising cases periodically that, that reach into these issues. Occasionally, the FTC does too, but most of the reporting on a lot of these claims of substantiation, uh, is, you're going to find the most guidance by looking at NAD decisions. So we do look at consumer preference claims all the time, comparative performance claims. Um, and there we always look to industry standards for you know, how you would compare the performance of a product if there is industry standard testing. We'll also look at proprietary testing if there's not. Um, there are, uh, you know, we look at taste and sensory taste preference claims, other kinds of sensory preference claims are things that we look at regularly. Um, I think we probably look at disparagement more often than anyone else. And, you know, to be clear, it's okay to disparage your competitor. You just can't falsely disparage your competitor. Um, so, so it's really important um, to look at NED guidance on, on how to carefully craft a comparative claim so that you don't overstate the benefits of your product as compared to a, a competitor's product um, and avoid, uh, you know, falsely disparaging a competitor. Um, again, we also look at survey evidence uh, very often in those disparaging commercials where you're disparaging a competitor. And I can think of many um, commercials we've looked at over the years. We'll look at survey evidence. Um, you know, we had a whole series of cases on, on whether or not satellite television services are subject to rain fade. And we've looked at a lot of um, commercials or a lot of surveys around whether or not consumers are taking away a message that it's always going to go out, sometimes going to go out, only occasionally going to go out, which is, of course, the supported message is that, you know, rarely in it or occasionally in bad weather, um, satellite television will go out. Um, but for other kinds of claims that the FTC sees a lot of um, and has provided a lot of guidance on, we defer to the FTC guidance on those issues. So when we're looking at testimonials and endorsements, we look to FTC guidance. Um, FTC cases on demonstrations, there are many, and we'll cite to those cases too. Um, and FTC's guidance on establishment claims and health-related advertising claims are, are areas where we defer to the FTC standards and look to the FTC's guidance on those issues. And the same with influencer marketing. You know, We may have had some early cases on influencer marketing, but when the FTC came out with its um, influencer marketing guidance and regularly updates its FAQs on that, um, we, uh, we apply that guidance across the board to really expand the impact that has 
beyond just the companies that may be following FTC guidance, but also those companies that get challenged for those practices before the National Advertising Division. I think that's a great point. And as I can say, as a practitioner, we, we look at both. We look at the FTC's guidance on these issues. And a lot of times the way it just works from a practical standpoint is FTC really starts with the educational guidance and it, and it then goes to maybe warning letters and then you start to see enforcement actions. And, and I think that it's, it's very helpful to have NAD reviewing and interpreting FTC's guidance and applying it in, in practical situations. As I mentioned earlier, it's got this robust body of cases that applies all these different types of, of guidance. And a lot of times when a client comes and says, um, we want to make this claim, uh, how, do we, how do we make this claim? Can we make this claim? Can we do this uh, on our influencer campaign? And we'll look to both. And I think that it's been very helpful to see NAD um, apply these issues because then we know how, how the FTC will. And for the most part, I tell clients if there's a question about a claim or practice, NAD probably has a decision or some guidance on it, as well as looking at the FTC guide. So I know that it's a very a very useful tool to practitioners and companies alike. And now maybe we'll talk about some of the defenses that we see in NAD challenges, as well as FTC challenges, uh, and, and see how we respond to those. Sure. So, you know, a frequent defense to an advertising challenge at NAD is that, they're, that the claim is puffery. Um, and I think, you know, certainly there's a lot of guidance in NAD case decisions about puffery. A lot of it dates back pretty far, um, and some of it dates back to our early case looking at Palm Wonderful's uh, claims about the benefits of its uh, pomegranate juice. And, and they were making claims that look a lot like puffery, like amaze your cardiologist and life preserver. And um, we looked at these claims both in a monitoring case in 2005 and then a competitor challenge in 2006. Um, and what we, what we said was that while those claims, maybe consumers don't think that your cardiologist is gonna be amazed or that your life is gonna be preserved forever, they are taking away a message, a health related message. And that message was reinforced by some of the other claims that were in the ad that made specific claims about the, the heart healthy benefits of drinking pomegranate juice, but very specifically tied to preventing heart disease. Um, and in both of those cases, we recommended that Palm make meaningful changes to their advertising to avoid overstating the, the science behind um, the health benefits of drinking pomegranate juice. At the time they had a pilot study showing some health, some potential benefits and health related factors, but not certainly not anything tying um, pomegranate juice to lengthening your life or preventing heart disease. Um, if only Palm had listened to us. Mary, I think you, you can take it from here on what happened to Palm after they went to the, after they went through their NAD challenges. Sure, yeah, so the FTC also investigated um, Palm Wonderful's claims for the pomegranate juice. Um, and they had, you know, there's a couple of samples up on the screen now, but there are many others. Um, one that said cheat death. Um, uh, and as Laura said, perhaps, you know, just the headline alone might be considered puffery, but when you look at the rest of the claims in the ad, um, they were actually making very specific claims about heart disease, uh, cancer, and the like. I would actually argue even a major cardiologist by itself is not puffery because you don't have a cardiologist unless you have a heart problem. So, you know, it's being tied to a specific health issue right there. Um, and the FTC had, a, uh, you know, looked at many of other claims and ads as well, um, for Palm Wonderful and actually in the end challenged um, several specific health benefit claims, disease prevention claims, and um, Palm Wonderful did not settle and the case was litigated um, through the administrative law process at the FTC and appealed to the full commission and then an appeal to the DC Circuit Court of Appeal and ultimately um, the commission won and the court ruled that these claims were um, misleading, that that Palm Wonderful did not have proper substantiation that they needed to have um, randomized controlled trials to support these specific uh, disease prevention claims. And they lacked those, they lacked that evidence. And um, so it, it took a long time, <laughs> I think, 
maybe six years in full, uh, but in the end, they're um, they're you know subject to uh, to a court order. Well, not a, yeah, actually no, it's not a court order. It's the FTC's order. And here's another another defense that we see a lot. It's a, it's trademark, the registered trademark, and this uh, defense was addressed uh, in NAD's case involving the world's best glass cleaner that was uh, promoted by Sprayway. And this was a trademark phrase, world's best glass cleaner. And the advertiser said, well, this can't be subject to NAD's review because it's a registered trademark. And NAD uh, noted that the registration and promotion of a trademark doesn't obviate the need for an advertiser to have substantiation for the expression when it conveys an objectively provable message. So NAD found that this was subject to review. For other reasons, though, NAD found that this was, in fact, puffery. Uh, it found, so, for example, that the, the word world best appeared a significantly smaller font than um, the word glass cleaner. You have this fanciful picture of a woman from back in the day. Um, it, it's juxtaposed there against the language. And so this was, this was found to be an exaggerated display of pride uh, in, the, in the product rather than uh, a claim that needed to have objective uh, substantiation versus all of the competitors in the world. Another um, another defense we hear a lot is uh, is humor. So I'm going to play this video. This is an original wood-fired Traeger grill. That's a propane gas grill. Hey, buddy, what flavor of propane are you cooking with? Gas. The problem with propane is when you cook with gas, your food tastes like gas. Are you guys tasting this? This hot dog tastes like gas. This dude is cooking food that tastes like gas. Perfect. If you want food that doesn't taste like gas, try it on a Traeger. Perfect wood fire flavor every time. Try wood fire instead. Try it on a Traeger. So Traeger had this advertisement that it would tell it grilled. Um, it, it, it wouldn't result in your food tasting like gas, uh, whereas a gas grill would have a have a gas taste. Um, and, and when that word was repeated so many times, it started to sound less like taste like gas. Uh, sounds like something else. And so um, the, the response by Traeger to the challenge was, well, this is funny. It's humor. We're just trying to make something. It was, we're thinking a joke here. It tastes like that. Um, and and then he said that it's just because something is humorous, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you do not have to have substantiation for it. And it, it looked to see whether or not this was puffery. The advertiser said it's humorous, so it's puffery. And then he said, you know, this is a statement about an objective, uh, objective fact about the product and it's also disparaging to your competitor's products. You're saying that their food doesn't taste as good as yours. It tastes like gas, which is pretty disparaging. And so even if a claim is conveyed in a humorous way, it does require substantiation. And they, uh, the advertiser did not produce um, sufficient substantiation to, um, to, to support a claim that, it, uh, that its competitors, um, to cook on its competitors' grills, tasted like gas. And, and so why don't we go on to some more recent developments? I know NAD has had a number of, uh, of initiatives that are exciting that we should address here too. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm really pleased to talk about our new, well, exactly not our newest track, but a track we introduced last year, um, Fast Track Swift. Uh, it, it's been around since, uh, beginning of April 2020, uh, and it was designed to uh, try and resolve advertising disputes more quickly. We recognize that advertising is in the marketplace very quickly these days. The, the, spe the, the lifespan of that ad campaign and often an ad claim can be quite short. So it was designed to be to resolve those kinds of cases in within 30 days um, or really 20 business days. Uh, the, the process, though, um, is limited to a single issue. And, um, and we can't and won't look at complex claim substantiation because there we feel we would, um, we would need more submissions from the parties and more time to analyze the issues. Uh, in, in Fast Track Swift, each party gets a single submission. All submissions are done online, are submitted through our online portal, which we'll talk more a little bit about. And, um, and, uh, and we have resolved those cases really, really, really fast. Um, the cases have all been resolved within that 20 business days um, and, uh, and some of them in a much shorter length of time. You wanna to go to the next slide, please, Shaheen? Um, 
so what kind of cases can you bring in SWIFT? Uh, there are really only, right now, there are only three kinds of cases you can bring in SWIFT. We will look at disclosures in SWIFT. We think that most disclosure issues can probably res be resolved quickly without multiple sub submissions from the parties and a lot of um, claim substantiation. It was really designed to uh, evaluate disclosures, particularly those in influencer marketing. And I know that we got a question a little bit about whether or not we look at hashtags. Um, certainly we do. Uh, you can make a disclosure in a hashtag um, and the FT C has a lot of guidance on that. Hashtag ad should do it. That should tell you whether or not that, well, it should tell consumers that that is an ad. Um, but we, uh, we also look at just, we can also look at disclosures in native advertising and also um, incentivized reviews that can all be looked at in SWIFT. Um, misleading pricing and sales claims, we can look at in SWIFT. Again, we don't think most of those cases are going to require complex claim substantiation and multiple submissions from the parties. But the area where we've seen the most challenges in SWIFT actually are misleading express claims. And then, um, and then we want to make sure that those express claims do not require, require a review of complex evidence or substantiation. Um, and, uh, and that and it, we certainly wouldn't want to have to look at clinical testing in a SWIFT case um, or, or even some industry standard technical testing, I think would be difficult to look at on that time frame. Um, we also want to make sure it's just a single issue. So very often in, in any challenge, you'll see, you know, uh, three or four issues raised in the challenge. Um, in in Swift, we'll just look at a single issue. But but again, it doesn't have to be a single claim. If, if there are multiple claims that raise the same issue, they can be looked at in Swift. And uh, Laura, I've encouraged a lot of clients to bring the Swift fast track challenge, uh, particularly where there's clearly delineated claims. And the client wants a fast resolution. I mean, I talked about it earlier, uh, going to court versus going to NAD. I think this is this is a great response to NAD to to the industry's maybe um, feedback that it, it's hard to get a fast resolution or, or super fast, if you will, resolution from NAD. And I know that the SWIFT process is really new, and and I've seen a lot of a lot of quick action by advertisers uh, in in participating in SWIFT and taking down claims. In fact, um, just voluntarily taking down the claim in response to the SWIFT. Could you speak a little bit about the benefits that you've seen so far um, to advertisers and challengers in the SWIFT program? Sure. So, um, so for a challenger, the the benefits are pretty straightforward, right? It's it's a very quick um, resolution of their challenge, and um, and you know, very often what we're seeing are challenges to claims that maybe the advertiser agrees or maybe the advertiser is willing to change because they're making changes very, very quickly within, you know, within a week or, or two of the challenge being brought. Um, the cases that go to decision, again, you're getting the, you're getting four weeks and in, into a decision. So it's, it's very, very, it's, it's, the benefits are pretty obvious for a challenger. For an advertiser too, I think, um, you know, I think the, the, there is a benefit to the, the fast resolution for an advertiser as well. Um, you know, because you don't have the uncertainty about where that claim is going. But, you know, for an advertiser, there's an added benefit that our decisions in SWIFT cases are very summary. Um, they don't provide detail on the, on, on the advertising claims. Uh, certainly when the cases are settled, there's, there's, or, or resolved without a decision, there's very little detail about the, um, about the advertising claim and the substantiation for it. But even when it does go to a full resolution, uh, the decisions are more summary more detailed than our initial NAD decisions. They do explain the reasoning and the analysis, which I think is really important um, for precedential effect uh, and also for the trust of the FTC that we're resolving these cases consistent with their standards. But it is a much more summary decision and they're released at the end of the month um, or in batches. So they don't all come out, they, our press releases come out with you know, three uh, swift cases at a time and, and therefore may detract some of the attention that our cases sometimes will get from the press. So, so there's a couple of examples of Swift case and I know we're running a bit out of time so I don't wanna go too depth on these but here are a couple of examples of claims that NAD took and found appropriate for Swift. So um, one of these was a number one pediatrician recommended brand claim that was uh, uh, advertised by Similac. And that, in that case, NAD found it appropriate for uh, SWIFT treatment because it didn't require it to review complex evidence and neither party, that was based on a survey of pediatricians and neither party um, uh, had, uh, took issue or challenged the reliability of that survey evidence. The only question was whether the questions posed or the, the buckets of categories supported the claim with respect to a number one pediatrician recommended brand. 
Here are a couple of others. Uh, similarly, in the function case, that it claimed that it had over 100,000 five-star product reviews for its shampoo and conditioner products. And that, again, did not involve too much um, a review of really complex substantiation. Instead, the NAD looked specifically at the, the number of reviews that Function had for its conditioner and shampoo products. And the concern there was that Function actually lumped, um, it, it had uh, reviews that were for both products, like the conditioner and shampoo product, and it took those apart and double counted those as specific reviews. So that 110,000 uh, five-star product reviews number was a little bit inflated. And I'm going to actually um, stop and say that uh, the CLE code for everybody for the presentation is Regulation 2021. And the next case that NAD found appropriate for so swift treatment was the Cliff Bar case. And that involved claims made on Google Ads. When people would search for energy bars or, or kind bars, they got this ad that, was a, that Cliff was a better performing bar uh, for sustained energy. And um, NAD again found that this was appropriate. It was a pretty straightforward claim. And the question was whether or not Cliff had a uh, substantiation to show that it actually provided um, better or more sustained energy than, than others. And, and that wasn't, there wasn't support through head to head testing on that one. Cliff gave some support, but it wasn't a good match to the claim. Um, so one of the new initiatives too that we're seeing is the online portal. Laura mentioned earlier that online um, adver advertisers or challengers can now submit um, their filings through this online portal. And this is actually really useful I know I've used it to submit a challenge. It's very user friendly. You can go online and, and just fill out essentially a form and upload the documents and, and that's you know, that's all it takes. And so I can attest that the portal is really accessible and user friendly. It walks you through each of the steps. And maybe that's a good a good question, Laura, for you is um, what, what are the steps that NAD has been taking to make the process more accessible uh, to companies? Sure. So, um, you know, keep your eyes on our website. The online portal is one is one area where we're trying to, you know, make it easier to file a challenge. Um, but we're also updating our website with FAQs um, and, and hopefully more resources for challengers who are new to the process. Uh, we really want the process to be accessible to companies of all sizes um, and, and not just for our traditional users. So, um, you know, it, to that end, we've also, back in 2020, introduced a filing fee for small companies, um, for companies with revenue of less than 250 million. We, um, we uh, have a reduced filing fee, substantially reduced filing fee. We really do want um, this, pro this process to be used and accessible because as I said, at the outset, it helps companies raise the bar to make sure that tr can't, consumers are getting truthful ads and, um, and really prevents hopefully a race to the bottom where uh, companies engage in the same practices that undermine consumer trust uh, because they have to, to remain competitive. Um, you don't have to do that. You can really use NAD to, to prevent practices from pervading a marketplace. And this, I guess, is the corollary to the SWIFT track, the new complex track. Yeah, it's to it's to resolve a different question, and I won't spend too much time on this. Um, so some cases that came to NAD, and, and in fact, a lot of cases that come to NAD involve a lot of complex claim substantiation. Sometimes they also will we'll have cases where um, they're the same claim or similar claims uh, across multiple different products or product categories. And um, and traditionally we've, we've had to go and ask an, a challenger to bring multiple challenges. The complex track allows companies that are concerned that, that the, the current process where they have you know three to four weeks to respond to the initial opening letter and a couple weeks to, to file their second submission, doesn't quite give them enough time to respond to all of the issues or all of the evidence that are raised in a standard track challenge. So, we, so we've created a complex track, which has a couple safeguards in place. And again, it's really just to give both challengers and advertisers a little more choice about how to, how to pursue a challenge and a little more predictability about how long a challenge might take. And I know we've seen case decisions in the SWIFT in the SWIFT process, but I think the complex we're still those cases are coming down the pipeline, is my understanding. And so, without divulging anything confidential, can you speak a little bit to how you're seeing it all play out? 
Sure. We have seen a couple of um, complex cases filed at NAD. Um, and some, an advertiser can opt to, and ask at NAD to move the case into complex track. We've seen a couple of those as well. Um, so uh, I think it, the process is working pretty well. The goal is not that they necessarily take longer than a standard track challenge, but to give companies some kind of assurance along the way about where NAD is. So they, there's a scheduling conference after the initial submission where you, you set out the, the schedule for the rest of the case. And then there's a, a check-in after the first set of submissions so that you get some, some Q&A actually with NAD about where they think the challenge is and where what other evidence we might like to see or why, you know, you give you an opportunity to tell us why that's not the kind of evidence we should be looking for. So I jumped the gun on this one, but I just felt like it was too timely, especially after we'd gotten a question on why should I why should I participate? <laughs> so, um, but Facebook has um, has been a good partner so far. We haven't had to send many cases to pay Facebook, but the couple of cases that we have sent to them, because again, we only send it to Facebook if the company doesn't agree to comply or participate in self-regulation. But the couple of ads, the ad campaigns that we've sent to Facebook, they've been very, very responsive on. And, and they, they get turned around in a matter of days to us and they'll take the ads down in days after an NAD um, letter to them. And looking ahead, um, the future of ad law, you can learn more about that and wh where we think things are going uh, by coming to our conference. Um, it's at the end of September 2021. We're hoping for at least partially in person. It's just now we call it hybrid, but I guess it's to be determined what that looks like. Um, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about how we, you know, how we hope maybe to expand the SWIFT process. Hopefully we'll have uh, news on other platforms that are agreeing to support self-regulation and take referrals from us, uh, but generally hear more about where, you know, how we think self-regulation and particularly independent self-regulation can help companies uh, make sure that the advertising in their, in their space is truthful to consumers. And, you know, if it's coming from an idealistic perspective or a realistic one about, you know, the concern about additional regulatory enforcement, self-regulation is really a good opportunity to help industries um, support a truthful and transparent marketplace. I, I think that's a great a great point to, to end on and, and I'm looking forward to seeing how the NAD evolves and changes the landscape and really helps form the landscape of truthful advertising and raising the bar to, to Lori and Mary's point earlier. So um, if you have any questions, here's our contact information. Please feel free to reach out to us. And um, here are some upcoming events that, that we have and resources. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, a recording of the session will be made available shortly on our website. And we hope you'll join us for other webinars in our symposium series, which are taking place on April 14th and 15th. We also invite you to visit our blog, All About Advertising Law, to help stay on top of other industry development and um, venable.com slash adlaw to learn more about us and to contact anybody if you have any questions. And thank you, Laura and Mary. We really appreciate you, you being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Shaheen. We appreciate you, you know, calling attention to the work that we're doing.